it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 82 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? This is cold brew. I have a feeling we're going to be doing cold brew for the next two or three months. Yes, and mine has some hazelnut creamer in it because I like a little of the flavor. Mine might have caramel creamer in it. (laughs) Shocker. Shocker. Are you ready to sip some coffee and talk? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 25% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus all products ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code COFFEELADIES25. Try it today. So how are you doing? Pretty well, pretty well. Hey, we have a live visitor. We do. Sammy the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel is under my feet. <laughs> he just speak. came down. Hi. Hi, buddy. He's like, what are they doing in the studio? I have to go down and check them out. <laughs> so yeah, great. I am really knee deep in a thousand projects on the farm. And we're supposed to have a new addition soon. Yeah. Should we keep it under wraps? For now. I'm yeah. superstitious. Yeah. Once she arrives, we'll tell people what we have. Yeah. (laughs) So how are you? I'm good. We're coming to the end of school soon. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, by the time this will air, school will be done for the summer. Yay. So it always makes life a little easier for me. We're not rushing around in the morning. Right. Although Sophia is on swim team, so she has to be at the pool. Oh, Sophia can drive herself now. Yay. She has to be there by 7 a.m. I'm sorry. Bye. I'm like, (laughs) you could be driving yourself to the pool now. That's for sure. Was Uh that you or Sammy? That was not me. (laughs) I don't think my feet reach that far across the table. (laughs) Like, who did I just step on? Did I kick you? No. (laughs) That was Sammy. And I'm looking forward to doing a few little day trips here and there, some for the show. Yes, we're planning our 4th of July episode, so we are heading off to visit a historic farm. Oh, that should be fun, and the girls always love those trips. Mm -hmm. And educational for them. Yeah, they just like to go because it's fun. That's what it is. They want to see the animals, too. Oh, that's why they're with them. (laughs) I know. It's like, let's just go and I'll see animals every day. So they're kind of the same, just trying to do projects around the house. I have to work on the runs. And Ella's on a lot of soccer tournaments, so we have to wait till that ends, and then I'm going to get you yeah. on some projects with me. Yeah. We're literally projects up to our eyeballs, so yeah. that's it's okay. Crazy. Good problem to have. It is. Okay. So I'm going to ask everybody a huge favor. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for our show, and not to mention, we love reading these reviews. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It also helps us immensely. You can tell a friend about the podcast. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can head over to our Etsy shop. Check out the t-shirts that we have for sale there. You can become a patron of the show. Visit patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership. One of them is a free monthly bonus episode. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast, visit our show notes, use our affiliate links, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me just take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with the chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the June Box, I absolutely love the embroidered rooster apron and the egg carton stickers. I love those chicken leg bands with charms and the egg cartons that go with those stickers. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your purchase and shipping is always free. It's such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box with at least a three-month subscription. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. 
Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. Okay, now it's about that time. Da, 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 la, 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 la. Time for the Breed Spotlight. Yeah. Breed Spotlight, yeah. This is an interesting breed because we were planning this breed and our guest last week said it was her favorite breed. Exactly. And we had already planned it. It was like, oh, it was meant to be. Well, it made me look at the breed in a much different way. Is it one that you can see in your flock? You know I want this chicken. <laughs> I was working on the research and I was like, why do I not have this chicken? Well, why is this chicken not in my flock? Here's the thing. It fits in the category of all the chickens I want. Yeah. So it's also one that I can see in my flock. We are talking about the Sultan. Yes. The Sultan is a beautiful rare breed chicken that originated in Turkey. Yes, it did. They were known as the Sarai Tauk or Sultan's Fowl. They were probably kept, and we don't like this word, but they were probably kept as ornamental poultry and they lived in the Sultan's Gardens. I thought we were going to say showbirds. Yeah, but it doesn't apply. Yeah. They really did keep them as living ornaments. That's not what <laughs> we do. Bees. That's not what I we know. do. That is one well, where we have to about say it, it but they we were, don't agree with it. But think about it, though. Put it in the context. Yeah. Pretty heinous things happen to chickens back well, in. Yeah, I mean, to be a, a, an ornament in a garden, as it's, long as you're fed, you'll be like, look, I'll stand here and look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> it does go all the way back to women's rights, even with chickens here. Well, according to the Livestock Conservancy, they have been present in the UK since about 1854 when they were shipped from Constantinople to Elizabeth Watts, who was okay. the editor of the London Poultry Chronicle. The Sultans arrived in the US in about 1867. They did appear in the first printing of the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1874. Does not surprise mm-hmm. me one bit. But the sad news is they are currently listed as critically endangered on the Livestock Conservancy's poultry conservation list. And if you listen to last week's episode, Ginger from McMurray Hatchery lists them as next in line. She thinks so, yeah. For rare breeds mm-hmm. behind the red caps. Right. So this is a pretty like, hey, everybody get behind this cause and get yourself assaulted. <laughs> When we talk to Jeanette Berenger, I feel like there's a core of four or five of them right now that I'm like, I really feel like I want to work with one of these breeds and I'm not sure which one. Well, you have the Nankin. I have nine Nankins. I have nothing to do with them. And I did fill out the poultry census. But well, I those have, nine Nankins yeah, pushed them over it. to okay. the next level. <laughs> but no, I mean, honestly, I'm thinking about the Sultan. I'm thinking about the Sicilian Buttercup. Yeah. The white face Black Spanish, and the Java. Yeah. I mean, Those... well, the Java, we have been drooling over forever. Yeah. So, anyway, back to the Sultan. I mean, this chicken, you have to look up on Google and look up some of these images. It's all white. It is. Now, a little bit of background. So, in about 1884, there's an author named John Taggart, and he wrote a book called The New American Poultry Book, where he talked about the popular breeds right. in the 1800s. So he mentions that the sultans were sometimes called feather-footed white Polish. They look exactly like that with a different comb. Right. They're not Polish, but they do share some of the characteristics. They have that skull shape. Yeah. And the wide nostrils. Yeah. The wide nostrils, you find them on the Polish, the Houdan, and the Krevkor. Right. And in fact, if you're looking for a breeders club for the sultan, you want to join the Polish Breeders Club. Yes. Because they are dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the Polish, the Krevkor, The Houdan and the Sultan. Which are all chickens I want. They all look like they probably had some kind of a distant ancestor. I mean, they 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 all have some sort of link. They're they're like they're like third and fourth, fifth cousins of each other. Something like that. So let's tell you about the Sultans, because they have it all going on. They have it all. All. Except for that comb. They have the V comb. It's a small V comb though. But they all have the V comb. So they have crests. Oh yeah. Beards. Yes. Muffs. Yes. Feathered legs and toes. Vulture hawks <laughs> and Go ahead. a fifth toe. They are the dream bird. <laughs> they are the fancies of the, all the fancy birds. They really are. They share everything. And they're bright white birds, all feathered. All white, right. So they're going to pop against the green grass for pictures. They're they going to really, be beautiful. They really are beautiful. This was kind of neat, too. They carry their wings low and they stand tall, a bit like bantams right. do. 
which kind of makes the silhouette even more distinct. I thought that was kind of cool. Well, here's the thing. Again, I'm, I'm going to go back to last week with Ginger. Mm-hmm. She says she liked to ship them all as bantams. Because, because the babies are so tiny. The babies are so tiny, and then you're not out of the woods until you get them through the first week. Yeah. So she says, that's so funny that you say they carry themselves like bantams, because that's how she looks at them also. Right. Until they get a little bit bigger. Yeah. Maybe there's somehow bantam line worked in. That's a good question. Like you said, they are pure white in color. They have slate blue legs and feet, which is very pretty. Now, they have white skin, and they're supposed to have pale colored beaks. The skin around their face should be bright red, not dark or blue-black. And the reason I mention that is because if you're looking for a purebred sultan, they don't carry any of those fibromelanistic tendencies. Right. So if you see a sultan with the dark skin, it probably has silky mix. mix. Yeah, exactly. They might start off pretty small as babies, but they're not tiny chickens. Hens run about four pounds. That's not tiny. It's not tiny. That's, that's on the line. Yeah, like Hornish. And roosters, about six. They're about the size of the Mediterranean. Yeah. So if you have leghorns, if you have Andalusians, they're all mm-hmm. going to be pretty comparable in size. So they could be They good just together. don't have that huge Mediterranean comb. <laughs> Even semifavorals. Yeah. I thought they would be much larger than the ones we have. I don't know. Are ours just like some kind of mini variety of semifavorals? Every time I pick up croissant, I'm like, I expect her to feel like a Brahma. And she's, no, their bodies are like yeah. little. So they'll fit in. Yeah. They'll fit they'll in. They'll fit in, right? <laughs> And the lavenders that I have in that run are big girls, but they're kind and just chill. Mm -hmm. So they'll fit right in. So, yes, we're saying we want the sultan. They do do well in warm climates. But like the silky, Uh they're going to need some protection from wind, from ice, snow. They're not going to be great when it's cold outside. Well, yeah. I mean, they're from Turkey. Yeah. I'm wondering if that feather coverage means that they need cool fans, too. You know what I feel about fans. They all need fans. I know. (laughs) Any chicken to me, when it's like no air is moving, I don't care what kind of chicken you are. To me, you need a fan. I would err on the side of giving them. I can't remember who I was having this conversation with. I don't think it was you, but we were talking about being off-grid, being an off-grid farm or something like that. And I was like, I'm going to need solar units for every single fan that I I run in my chicken coop. Okay. (laughs) Nine out of (laughs) ten conversations we have about this stuff is you and me. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, I need solar units for every single fan because my girls need their fans. Or battery. Take me off the grid, but I want my batteries. Well, that was what started it, because we have, in our omelet coops, we have those small battery-powered fans attached to the vent in all of our omelet coops, and it works really well. That's where that conversation came from. (laughs) Anyway, so over time, unfortunately, the breed has lost some of their potency. The hens used to be pretty good layers of medium-sized white eggs. They were supposed to have produced somewhere between like 160 and 200 a year. And we heard that does not happen. That's what we heard. We heard from multiple people. Yeah, that the numbers are lower on their That the numbers are lower. So they are going to be like your fancy bird. Well, if you're doing conservation breeding, I don't even know how you go about this. But if you're doing conservation breeding, working on their egg production might be a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you would do that. They only go broody occasionally. So it's one of those never say never. Sometimes they do. I don't think it's a regular occurrence. If you have them in a mixed flock, chances are you're going to have a bird that may go broody in your flock. Yeah, slip an egg under there. Yeah. I've got to say, some of the cutest chicks I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. These Once you look them up, you're going to want with, And they are white as chicks. Yeah. And they've got that little puff ball on their head. My They're heavens. super cute. So cute. They're not known to be super hardy when they're young. That's what Ginger was saying. With shipping them, it's tough. Yeah. Because they're so tiny. And sometimes you ship them with somebody who's buying standard birds. As chicks, they're so much smaller. Yeah. So it might be a good breed if you have a minimum order of six. Mm-hmm. You get three, I get three, we each get three. Right. And we get them all together. Yeah. You know, so it's not like... Oh, we're each going to get three salt. <laughs> I've already made this plan. Okay. Up. All right. <laughs> so that way they can ship well together. But all reports do say that once they reach adulthood, they tend to have a strong constitution and be a lot healthier. Well, so. that's what she was saying. Once you get them past one week, you're pretty good. Yep. Imagine how nervous I would be that first week. Maybe. Oh, no. No. Oh, my God. I can't. They're calm, they're friendly, they're gentle foragers. Yeah. With that a was reputation surprising. for not tearing up gardens. Okay, because everyone says cochins and brahmas with the feather feet are really gentle on the grass. I don't know what grass they're talking about. Why are they? Because my cochins and brahmas will tear up the grass just as well as anyone else. Let's go back to the fact that they were in gorge gardens as ornaments. Right. It's bred into them not to eat up the garden. They're like, now you be there and you be good in the garden. I don't know how someone bred that into them. I'd like them to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, stay away from the snap peas. Stop. No. Just stand there and look pretty. Right? Why don't you? 
But yeah, I've read that in various places that they're supposed to be super gentle in the garden. Hey. Okay, we'll go with it. Okay. That's definitely not Gertie. No. How many times have I yelled at Gertie to get away Gr- from the You know how sometimes I know where Gertie is because I see a pile of mulch flying through the air? <laughs> Gertie's like, oh, I haven't been over there in a while. Let me go mess that up. So she needs to take lessons from the Sultan. Clearly. Maybe they're not a great homestead breed because their egg numbers aren't high at the moment, but they are fantastic for families. And chicken ladies. Yeah, who want to hug big, big fluffies. Yes, and they're fancy. They're fancy. I mean, they've got everything. They do. Including the fifth toe. Muff, beard, crest. Yes. All of it. Now, number one place we've been talking about where you can get these birds. Mm-hmm. McMurray Hatchery. Yep, McMurray has them. I did find them at some of the larger hatcheries as well. Yeah. The Polish Breeders Club has a breeder's directory. Right. And you can always check the Livestock Conservancy Breeders Directory. The other place you can find them. Now, this is buyer beware. Oh, totally buyer beware. And you can find hatching eggs on eBay. First of all, if you can't have boys, don't even go this route. Uh, yeah. Because you don't know what you're going to get. Oh, have yeah. Have ever heard of someone say, I hatched eggs and every single, so, single one was female? Never. It's like, you, you never hear that. You always hear they were all boys. Yeah. If you're out there and you have the Sultan, send us pictures. We will give you a share on our storyboard. And we love, love, love seeing pictures of you all with your chickens. Wait till I tell Pete I want another coop so I can fit Sultans in it. (laughs) It's for conservation, Pete. That's that's what it is. This is conservation work. I don't mean to do this, but I have to tell this story. You don't mean to tell the story, but you're going to tell the story. Yeah, because it kind of goes along with this. Okay. Because Pete's going to hear this and we're not going to be able to pull the wool over his eyes again. But when I was working at Eastern, my first animal hospital, and we did this work with a nearby pet hospital, a pet store, and we were going to save all these animals that they would just throw out or whatever. Uh We brought a kitten that had major conjunctivitis going on in one eye. Okay. We bring her back to the hospital and we start treating her and we're like, well, we can't send her back. And of course, the nurse's syndrome, I fall in love with her. Of course. I'm talking about Scooter. Oh, that was Scooter. Oh, okay. okay. So Scooter, we thought that she was not going to have an eye under there because it was so bad. Right. So we start treating her and she has an eye. I'm already in love with her and I have no cat. I've never had a cat. I'm still living at home with my parents. And I'm like, I'm adopting this cat. And my my parents are like, don't bring any animals home. And I'm like, I've already committed. I'm like, I have this cat. I've committed to this cat. So I take her home for a day. They're like, no, take this cat back. So we're going on a two-week vacation. And I said, okay, well, if she doesn't get adopted in the two weeks, they're going to have to put her down, which was a total lie. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, (laughs) man. Look at you. I was like, they're going to have to put her down because they won't be able to find her at home. So I go to work, put her in the cage and put real big Chrissy's cat. Do not touch. Boarding for my vacation. So we come back and I said to my mom, like, no one adopted her. This isn't good. She's like, bring the cat home. (laughs) Like, yes. Oh, my God. (laughs) See, it's for conservation. (laughs) And the moral of the story is lies to your family members so you can have the animal. Well, it's 17 or 18. That's what I did to get a cat. But Too I've told pigs. them the story a lot since then. Okay. And they laugh. Well, oh, there you go. They're laughing. I'm like, I did come clean and tell you like well, five I mean, years after 17, you were, yeah. <laughs> now I got to watch Sophia with this. Right? Like, that's my story to Joe. Conservation. Conservation breeding. All right, we've got it. Are you looking for a vintage small farm feel for your egg packaging this year? Or are you looking to develop a unique brand image with custom packaging? The A Carton Store offers a wide variety of recyclable cartons, customizable stamps, poultry care products, and a robust customizing tool to design your own labels. Plus, they offer fast, free shipping on all cartons and labels. Visit acartonstore.com for all of your egg carton, label, stamp, and poultry care needs this spring. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosty's store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, water or nipple, and water or cup kits. And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosty's range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move into main topic, yeah. Yeah. This is a main topic a lot of people have been wanting us to do. Yes. And it's kind of one that we've wanted to do. It's, well, I really needed fun, to do kind of. a lot of, not my usual research. It, it required some different research, and we weren't afraid, pardon the pun, that it was a meaty enough topic. Yeah, but it's going to be meaty enough. I know it. Yeah. 
So we are talking combs and waddles, yeah. Otherwise known as combs and waddles. <laughs> <laughs> I like to sing it. So combs and waddles, some of the most distinguishing features on a chicken. I mean, you know the silhouette of a chicken, but how much do you really know about combs and waddles? How much do we really know? We well, know, we a, know lot. a lot now. <laughs> We want to share our wealth of knowledge. <laughs> so combs and waddles, there's all different kinds. So the chicken's nearest relative is the jungle fowl. Do they have combs and waddles? They do have combs and waddles, yeah. I mean, not enormous ones, but they do have combs yeah. and waddles. My other question is why do chickens have that bright red skin on their combs and waddles? Or I guess I should say how. We are going to cover the whys, but how does the skin turn that color red? Well, we know one thing. Hormones are in play. Right. This was interesting. So it's because of the type of melanin that's in their dermis or skin layers. Mm -hmm. There's more than one type of melanin, which I had no idea about. All right. It's pheomelanin. Pheomelanin on us are things like our pink lips. Right. Things like that. In the chicken, pheomelanin provides that red coloring on the chicken's faces, the combs, and the waddles. And it also affects some of their plumage color. Right. But that's a different subject. Let's talk about comb shapes. Yes. Because we get this question all the time. And we actually did get a question a week or two ago. What kind of chicken is this? And we were saying it's so important in the pictures that mm -hmm. we see the type of comb. In that instance, that was really an important It was one. interesting because the chicken looked like a light Brahma. Yeah. She did not have feathered legs. She was Columbia pattern. Right. Very much so like a Brahma. And she was a large chicken, except she didn't have the feathered legs. And so we eliminated the Brahma. And so the possibilities were a light Sussex. Right. Or a Colombian Wyandotte. And the comb tells the tale there. Exactly. So we have to have those pictures. So here's the type of comb. Yeah, now she the, was a Colombian Wyandotte. Yeah. So let's go over comb shapes. Uh -huh. The first is the most common, and it is the straight. And where do you see the magnificent straight combs? Where? The Mediterranean. Yes, leg horns, yeah. all of those. Even my Warpingtons have some really yeah. nice straight combs. Jersey Giants do too. And the thing with straight combs is a lot of the Mediterranean girls have the comb flop over. Perfectly normal, it's still a straight comb. If you like a big comb and you don't want a boy, mm -hmm. Mediterraneans are the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. They're straight, some flop. Okay, so next one. The rose comb. Okay. Dominique. Yes, I was going to say Dominique. Dominique have the smaller rose comb. And the wine dots have the rose comb. Yes. You also see those huge rose combs on the red cap and the old English pheasant. Fell. Yes. That really large old style rose comb. Okay, so let's go to the pea comb. Brahma's. Yes. Little are. bitty, bitty, bitty comb. Very good for very cold climates. Walnut. Now, the only place I've ever seen a walnut comb is on a silky. Yes, that's what you were talking about. You well, said my honeysuckle has my one. honeysuckle, who is half Swedish flower, half silky, has a walnut comb. It literally does look like a little ruffly walnut. Right. So the V comb, which we know there's plenty. That's our salt. Salted. The Polish. Kremper, the Houdan. Mm -hmm. Wait, does the Polish have the V? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they do. they do. Yeah. Okay, the crown. That's the Sicilian buttercup. Yes. What it looks like is if you picture two small straight combs. Yeah. But it's attached. Yeah. It's literally like a little crown on their head. It's beautiful. I just, I always talk about when we were at the poultry swap and you were drooling over the little Sicilian buttercup little boy yeah. with his comb. Now, if he had had hens to go with that little boy, we would have been coming home with some buttercups. So let's go to strawberry. Strawberry, one of the lesser known combs. Yes. The strawberry is often found on the melee and the Yokohama. Yes. And then finally, the cushion. Who has the cushion comb? The Chanticleer. That's right. Honestly, I'm fascinated by all the different comb shapes and sizes. I love them. If you're going to have chickens and going to be a chicken lady and love looking up chickens, it is a good thing to know the combs because they will help you breed wise. It and helps knowing you with breed ID. Yeah. Combs also are something to consider. If you're looking for a homestead breed and you don't want to use a lot of power, yeah. you know, you want to get the appropriate breed to your area. Right. Or if you're all about fancy, fancy schmancy, you might like somebody with an enormous rose comb. It's not a complete guide, but the British Hen Welfare Trust yes. does have a nice guide to comb shapes. They so we'll do. look to that. It's like a drawing of this yeah. one, and it shows mm -hmm. you the shape. So it's really important to know. So now that you know the shapes, let's go into what their job is. It's to regulate heat from their body. Yeah. So here's the thing. Chickens don't sweat. Right. Okay. There's a lot right. of animals that don't sweat. We're lucky enough to, sweat. to be sweaty. Okay. That's what I think when I've been cleaning coops for two hours. Heck I'm like, damn, yeah. I'm lucky to sweat. Well, it's true. It is true. A lot of animals, let's say dogs, they can't sweat. Right. Or they can only sweat in limited areas. Right. So these are part of the heat regulatory system. Mm -hmm. So they let heat escape the body through the comb, through the waddles. We There's were just... no feathers there. No. So the skin is open to the wind. 
which is why the Mediterranean breeds probably evolved with those huge combs because they really needed that extra skin to help them with heat tolerance. That's right. Exactly. So when you're going to have a bird that's more comfortable in a warmer area, you'll notice their combs will be larger. Mm -hmm. It's just bred into them. Yeah, yeah. The birds that are for colder climates are going to have smaller combs, and that is for preservation of heat. Peak combs. Yeah. Or smaller straight even. Right. You know, right. some of them have big straight combs, some are, have smaller. Mm-hmm. So the waddles. This is my own thing. I think the waddles are clearly to be dunking in water. Well, <laughs> to cool down the body that way. They yes. always go in the water. And you wonder why the males have bigger ones. This is nature. Animals with big, colorful things to show off, it's generally for sexual attraction. Yeah, it's, and generally the male. And so Ricardo Montalban, the rooster, not the actor. <laughs> the rooster, not the actor. He would take a big drink, and he had some of the biggest waddles I've ever seen on a chicken. So he would take his drink, right? <laughs> and he would throw his head back. He would shake those wet waddles. And the heads like, were like... Police, I know. Can you stop this ridiculous. He mess? honestly thought they were like, "Ooh, baby." <laughs> you know they were like, "No, no." Just they look, were like, look at him. He's just no. They were like, him. "Oh my god, can you please stop with this?" <laughs> Probably a large comb, the waddles. It's all supposed to be impressive. Exactly. I guess it is kind of impressive, but I mean, he was trying to entice them with those <laughs> waddles, like, and they were like, "They're like, Mm-mm. come on, baby, I got some big comb and waddles over here." She's like, "Oh my god, I just <laughs> want to eat. Go away." <laughs> Combs and waddles also communicate a ton of information, both to humans and other chickens. This is one thing we wanted to really make sure everyone understands. Mm -hmm. It's a way to tell how your chicken is feeling without any other thing. Right. Or the maturity of your chicken. Is another form of communication. It's a form of visual communication between you and your chicken, and unfortunately or fortunately, depending, between other chickens. So generally, when you see pictures of chickens, their combs and waddles are bright red. Now, right. that is always true of a chicken who is laying eggs mm-hmm. and healthy. Those are going to be plump and red. Well, and that gets into the whole sexual connection because hormones do play a huge role. Huge. Most roosters will not even approach a female who looks young and does not have a developed comb yet. It right. certainly isn't red yet. He knows she's not sexually mature. So as your pullets start to grow and they're going to be starting to get into the point where they're going to lay some eggs, you're going to notice the comb get larger mm-hmm. and the comb get red. Right. These things all happen at a different time frame. So you might have one that their comb grows a little bigger, a little quicker, more red. That doesn't mean they're a boy. It's quite individual amongst both breeds and individual chickens. Yeah. And there's also some things like dehydration and poor circulation that the comb can tell us. That's true. So if your chicken tends to have a little bit of a purplish tinge to their comb, It can mean poor circulation, but it can also mean it's the first thing in the morning and they haven't had anything to drink or eat. So let them eat and drink a little bit. Over the years, I've occasionally had roosters that would have a little bit of purple tinging on the back of their comb. Yeah. And for a while I searched, I was really worried about this, but it often is just like a circulation issue in the back of the comb. When yeah. Huge combs usually. Or usually they just need a little bit to drink and eat and it's like they're a little well, it's dry. it's not necessarily dehydration in that case, that little tinge of purple. It's usually circulation. Yeah. A pale comb can give you lots of signs of illness, including anemia that could be from mites and lice. Or from parasitic overload, like right. intestinal parasites. Yep. You'll look up a lot of things if you're looking up for worms. Their comb is pale. Their waddles are pale. This is because these animals are living off of them and taking blood away from them. Mm-hmm. So that is why they become pale. The other thing that we found, which was really interesting, we don't necessarily believe that this could be true, but it's something we found. Yeah, I'm not 100% convinced, but I can think of some instances that make me think it could be correct. And then on me, it's like, I don't, we've read some things where some people were saying the bigger the comb and waddles, that's going to be your top chicken. The highest in the pecking order. Yeah. And you know what? I have a leghorn who has the biggest comb and waddles and she's not, she's near the bottom. But I still think there's a lot of individual personality that plays mm-hmm. along with it. Yeah. She does get herself in there and she does get her comb pecked quite right. a bit. So I think she is trying to jockey for positions yep. at times. So you will notice that. The other thing is watching their pecking of the combs is mm-hmm. really important. Yeah, you can definitely have injury to the comb, pecking injuries. So what are the bad things that can happen to combs? Pecking injuries, frostbite, anything else? Just dryness. I always keep like green goo to put on the comb Mm -hmm. to keep it moist. Because sometimes when it's really hot outside, it does dry the comb out. Uh Or really cold. Yeah. So, I mean, just weather-wise health. Just keeping an eye on them. The thing you said about frostbite, we should address that. The bigger the comb, the more chance of frostbite. Right. 
So we always recommend in the winter, if you have a Mediterranean breed or a breed with a large comb, to use a cozy cupeter, coat the comb with a protectant like Vaseline or something along those lines. So there are two types of frostbite. The first is where there's moisture in the air and it freezes and that ice settles on the comb and you get surface frostbite. People don't talk about this enough. The other is when it is so cold that blood vessels freeze in the comb. Right. That's a serious problem. And that's when you're going to lose the comb. It's going to fall And off. that's where you have a big risk of necrotic tissue and infection. Another place where you might find some infection is actually a fungal infection. Right. You can find a fungal infection in the comb and wattles. I used to have another Silky Cross who had a walnut comb, okay. and she would occasionally get a little bit of a fungal infection in some of the folds. I think you have to really watch the chickens that have the folds. Yeah. Because in between moisture, moisture is your enemy with everything. When you get moisture in between the little crevices, that can cause an infection. So you want to make sure that's dry. But all in all, the combs and wattles can tell you a lot from breed of the chicken to health of the chicken. They have a big job to do. They do. One other thing that just occurred to me that you need to watch out for combs and wattles, and it doesn't happen tons. It tends to happen during mosquito season, yeah. and that's foul pox. Oh, yeah. So you can have a lump or lesion on the comb, mm-hmm. and that can be a sign of foul pox. So yeah. look out for those things. Yeah. The comb and wattles, they do the heat regulation. They signal sexual readiness. Yes. And they can tell you tons and tons about the health of your birds. Oh, yeah. Healthy, shiny, bright red combs and waddles. That's what you want to see. And very plump. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to message us on Instagram or send us an email and we'll try our best to answer the questions for you. Okay. So we're ready to move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. So this one you wanted to do, I am not a fan of this, but... Oh, I love it. I will say that in an upcoming episode, we're doing an episode on egg preservation. Yes, we are. And the reason we're doing it now and not in the fall is because right now is when we have eggs coming out of our ears. Oh, we need preservation of those eggs. Right. So this is another preservation method. It's just a fun little recipe. I adore these pickled eggs. I do not like pickled eggs. Oh, God, I love them. Have you tried different flavors of them? Just pickled. (laughs) Well, like, they're, the thing is, there are different recipes. Like, you can do pink pickled eggs with beets. Oh, no, no, no. You know I don't like beets. Oh, delicious. <laughs> or you could do dill pickled eggs, which is our recipe, now, or curried pickled eggs. That's your, you do a good job with this. Probably the only one that I would try would be the dill pickled eggs. Okay. That's why I picked the dill pickled eggs, because I know you like dill. Well, I'm going to talk really quickly about the pink pickled eggs. Pickled eggs in general are really good for snacking. They extend the life of your hard-boiled eggs. They're great with drinks, like cocktails. Yes. They are delicious sliced into a salad, and I really think it's super fun if you do it with bantam eggs. Oh, I'm sure it would be, yeah. Really cute. Okay, so let's go down what you need. The easiest version is the pink pickled eggs. Like, this is super easy. Okay. So buy pickled beets, eat the beets. and Do then not eat the beets. Eat the beets. No, I hate beets. I will eat the beets. Ah! And then add as many hard-boiled eggs as you can cover with the liquid. Put it in the undrained beet jar. Refrigerated for about a week, you have got adorable pink pickled eggs. Enjoy. Delicious. They're so They're good. They're cute, but they taste like beets. No, actually, they have, have kind of a sweet pickly taste. They're good. Have you ever eaten a beet pickled egg? Yes. I don't like them. Okay. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Trust me, they're really good. The dill pickled eggs now. So this one, you're going to make your own pickling solution. Okay. So let's start. You're going to have a dozen eggs. Yep. Vinegar, white, water, salt, garlic, peppercorns that are whole. Right. Fresh dill, which I do love, Mm -hmm. and some pickling spices, which are optional. Yeah, I think you get a more complex flavor with them. You can buy them at Tractor Supply. Oh, it's super easy. Yeah, Amazon, any place. Yeah. Obviously, your eggs are going to be hard-boiled and peeled because this is not good if you don't peel your eggs. No, 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 no. (laughs) You do the work to peel the eggs, and then when you pop one of these babies out of the jar, they're good to go. Yeah. You don't have to stop and peel them, so... You want a non-reactive saucepan where the vinegar is not going to discolor it. Yes, like stainless steel. Right. Or enamel, ceramic, something like that. Something. So you're going to do water, vinegar, salt, and you're going to bring that to a boil over high heat. Okay. So you want a jar. Sometimes you can get the big dill pickle jars. To me, that would be better. Yeah, you can absolutely reuse jars that you've had for whatever. The bigger, the better if you want to fit a whole bunch of eggs in there. You can buy new. You can recycle. In the jar, you're going to pack the eggs, the dill, the peppercorns if you're using, the garlic. The garlic is whole cloves. And right. With them, I feel like the more the merrier. Yeah. I want a ton of dill and I want a ton of garlic. Yep. And the pickling spices if you're using. Right. 
you're going to pour that hot vinegar mixture into each jar right. covering the eggs. Put the lid on and let it cool. Put it in the fridge when it's cool. Give it about a week. That's it. Yeah. This can extend your eggs by a month or two. Well, yeah, of course, the vinegar makes everything last longer mm -hmm. and you're flavoring the vinegar. Right. So that's where the pickling comes in. Right. I'm just not a fan of beets. Well, that was only the first recipe. I know. I'm willing to try the other ones. But yeah, you're still beets. stuck on that. For some reason, I've tried beets. They were not good. Pete makes this face if I even say the word beets. I put beets in the garden. They're a variety called Long Keeper okay. to store in a root cellar. Guess who will not be eating those beets? <laughs> The beets are all mine. Anyway, don't worry. You don't have to bring them here either. I'm not. They're all mine. <laughs> I love beets. If you and do I love this. eggs that are pickled. <laughs> she does love her pickled eggs with beets. With beets. So if you do this, take some pictures, send them to us. We'll give you a share. Yeah. If you have a recipe you want to share, like if you've come up with a really tasty recipe, because you're preserving, the key to this is to make sure everything is super clean and sterile oh, before yeah, you pack your jars. Run them through the dishwasher, your jars. Yeah, you could do that. And then they're going to the fridge, and that extends the life even longer. You know, I've never done this, but can you make egg salad out of pickled eggs? I'm sure you could. That'd probably Why be not? Tasty. Why not? I just eat them, but yeah. That should be a recipe we do. I think it might have to be. Holly Ann's beet egg salad. Yeah, it'll be pink. <laughs> More for me, man. I will eat it. So, are we ready to move on to retail therapy? Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping with our favorites. Vintage things that we like to collect. We're doing salt and pepper shakers today. Another really good collection. I don't feel guilty about them. They don't take much space. And I actually use them fairly frequently for cake toppers. We actually use them all the time for cake toppers. Yeah. And I like them because you can use them for anything you want, right down to just a little shelf decoration. Or if you are having some people over and you want to decorate the table, you can place them throughout. They're little. They'll draw their eye to them, mm -hmm. but they're not overwhelming. You could put one on each plate with a name attached to it. Yes, you could. Oh, a place setting. Right. It has a hole right in it for a little Well, I was going to say you could put a toothpick with a banner that yeah. has the name of a dish. No, so you could use them like um, that's for, a great what, idea. Do you, what do you call that? Labeling of food. I don't know. It's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. I will say that my favorite chicken salt and pepper shakers that I found lately were the ones that we got in Cracker Barrel last December. Oh, yeah. They're tiny. Yeah. But they're these beautiful little glazed porcelain birds. Oh, yeah. And they were 99 cents a piece. Oh, yeah. They were super cute. And I just absolutely love them. If you had dinner for eight, if you bought eight of them. That would be cute for Oh, eight how bucks. adorable would that be? Yeah. So this is why we like the salt and pepper shaker because it's versatile. You mm -hmm. can use it wherever, whenever, just in pictures. And you can collect them. If you have too many, you can store them in a small box somewhere yes. and switch them out. Yeah. So again, we're going on chicken overload. If you have a lot of chicken collectibles, nah. this is one <laughs> that is smaller and there's lots of vintage ones out there yes. that you can find in secondhand stores. There's a ton of Japanese export. Oh, tons. Tons. And then there's new, there's old. You know, you know we like to go for the vintage. We mm -hmm. like the old school. But if you just Google it, you will have fun. The usual suspects, eBay, Etsy. Right. You're going to find the most on but like you said, the ones from Cracker Barrel, usually every season Cracker Barrel has a chicken line. So right. that'll be fun to see if we can get another set there. One of the things I like about the salt and pepper shakers are, you know that I like to collect figurines or statuettes yeah. where it's a hen and a rooster. Yeah. I love that the salt and pepper shakers are often a hen and a rooster. They are. Not always, but often. Oh, yeah. This reminds me. Everybody knows just recently, beginning of May, I went to Mexico with my husband's work where it's like a big group of friends. And in Mexico, chickens are big, too. And also pottery in Mexico is big. Yeah. So, of course, I'm going to bring my bestie something back from Mexico. <laughs> right. So I'm in a store and I go in the back and all the chicken pottery. You know where I'm going with this. Uh-huh. And they're so cute. And I pick one up and it says $15. I turn to the lady who's sitting next to me. I'm like, is this for both? And she's like, no, that's for one. $15 for a salt shaker and $15 for a pepper shaker. So I said, Holly will be getting one. And I'm well, getting the other. <laughs> and they will meet on the top of a cake. So I said to Holly, I'm like, okay, here's your salt and pepper shaker. But it's either salt or pepper. And I get the other one. 
was one a hen and one a roo. You took the hen, which I was surprised. Did I? Well, it's because I have a million roosters. Yeah, but sometimes they're priced separately, which you never expect that with a salt no, and pepper shaker no, set. Not usually. And I'm like, I'm not willing to spend thirty dollars on this set for myself or for one of us. So we'll each get one. If you're out there exploring in the wild and looking for them, some of the most collectible and really, really cool ones are the stacking yes. salt and pepper shakers. They often come from Japan. Yeah. I think they're really, really neat. You can find There's nesting hens. Oh, yeah. They're super So it's cute. a set of salt and pepper shakers. It's two hens, smaller hen on the top of the other one. Very cute. It's another thing to look up, to have fun with, see what you can find. And the other thing is when you're in the wild... That means yard sales, thrift stores, secondhand stores, that means antique not stores. not off from a dealer, not off of eBay or Etsy. Look for these because there's a lot out there mm -hmm. and you might see some that catch your eye. We're not going to give you like one brand or the other because we love them all. There's a mid-century modern design that I really, really like. And it's usually a rooster, sometimes a hand. It's usually a rooster. And he has like two flat faces on his sides where the salt and pepper shaker sit. Yes. Alyssa bought me the blue one. Yeah, we don't have the salt and pepper shakers for him. Do you have one too? No, I don't have one. I have a deviled egg set, a deviled egg plate. Yes, and it's the, like the same maker. Right, and the salt and pepper shakers are chickens and they sit in the middle of the deviled egg plate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. Like sometimes you can find a piece and not the other piece. But, you know, even Andrea a few months ago had salt and pepper shakers in her box. They were the Super cutest. cute. They so go on a cake. If you have five free minutes and you don't know what to do, Google chicken salt and pepper shakers, and you'll know what we're Keep talking about. Keep an eye out at yard sales and that sort of thing. And show us pictures. Inexpensive and easy to collect. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week is our 4th of July episode. Extravaganza. We're doing another fun and interesting heritage breed. We are talking the Java. Our main topic, we are visiting the National Colonial Farm in Aquakeek, Maryland, we're going to learn about raising poultry in early America. It's going to be fun. Fascinating stuff. Our recipe, old-fashioned vanilla custard ice cream. Now I can get behind this recipe. Mm -hmm. And our retail therapy, we're doing a cookbook, the first American cookbook by Amelia Simmons, which was written in early America. Yes, the very first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. Don't forget, we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.